All right, let's open our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 30. And uh, this section of Scripture has uh, some tremendous insight, some of the uh, most important lessons that put into practice in our lives as we seek to follow the Lord are in these chapters. And there are also some of the hard lessons to learn. So this isn't... uh, uh, there's, there's, there's great hope in these verses. There's great um, comfort. Uh, so there's encouragement. But this is more uh, growing as a believer, putting these things into practice. The things that Israel was struggling with, that Isaiah is going to be, and God speaking through Isaiah is going to be dealing with, are some of those uh, more entrenched uh, things that are in our human nature that are hard to get at, right? Like it takes time. And so um, we talked about chapter 30 this morning, so I, I won't really put as much emphasis. What I, I really think is kind of one of the main uh, points through this whole section uh, of Isaiah. Uh, we'll, we'll hit it again in chapter 31 as well, but uh, it starts off with a woe. So that kind of tells you where we're headed. You, don't, you, know, you start off the section with a woe. So I see the Dodgers, like we don't want to talk about the Dodgers and say the word whoa at this state. Like it's like, no, you want to say go, right? You want to say go Dodgers or whatever. That's what, that's, I'm rooting for them. My team's out. So I'm all Dodger blue, baby. Like, you know, so we'll see what happens. Giants fans, I heard the groans, so don't worry. You know, you guys are at your championship, so enjoy the life without Bochi. But, uh, you know, whoa, that, that's like, that's a, oh, that's that noise. It's, it's a sort of a, it's a guttural noise, a bad it's you know and what's the issue is rebellion he says woe to rebellious children says the lord the the word rebellion also is translated as stubborn the concept is of this stubborn pride that's rejecting what god said and you know i'd rather sustain my stubborn pride than surrender to what god says the way out is super easy but i i will trade this really valuable thing to hold on to my stubborn pride when in reality, like, no, trade your stubborn pride. The thing you're going to get is way better. But whoa, you're going to get a whoa holding on to that. So, and the issue in particular is that they're, they're open to counsel, to, like in the sense that as long as it's counsel that agrees with them. He says, they take counsel, but not from me. He gets specific about their, their rebellion. They'll, they're taking counsel, but not of me. They just devise plans, but not of my spirit. And the real issue is the last phrase in, in verse 1, that they might add sin to sin. So I've chosen a course of action. I'm determined to continue in this course of action. And, and I had to rebel against God to do it, but one rebellion won't be enough. There's gonna, it's going to be a protracted, continual, well, I did this, but in order to stay there, I have to keep doing I have to do this. And then in order to keep that, I have to do this. And it's adding sin to sin. And this is, this is just a very natural, normal uh, progression that we see uh, in our lives, in our flesh, you know, everybody struggles with this. Israel's come to the end of the road at, at this particular time. God is done with this, and he's going to deal with them in a severe way. And it's specifically, verse 2, they're, they're, they've got a political solution to their problem. They are going to look to Egypt for help. They're going to strengthen themselves, he says, in the strength of Pharaoh, trusting in his shadow. Whose shadow should they be trusting in? If, you get the shadow, if you're in the shadow of God, that means you've got the presence of God, right? In order to have someone's shadow, you've got to have the real thing there. So we'd rather be in the shadow of Pharaoh. And God's like, I'm right here. But no, we'd have to give up our sin to be here. So we're going to keep our sin, and we're going to go here. And uh, it's going to be a huge mistake. Uh, they're not going to benefit, verse 5 says. You're going to be ashamed. This is prophetic. It hadn't happened yet. But it does happen. The Assyrian army does move into the region. The the, not, the the Egyptians go to meet them. There's a tremendous battle. It's historical. They lose. The Egyptians lose. The Assyrians move in. They, they conquer uh, the land. And so there's a warning of that. Uh, the Egyptians in verse 7, in verses 6 and 7 is a, this warning, but it says the Egyptians in verse 7 will, will help in vain and to no purpose. So you're, you're looking for help and you're not going to be helped. This is not your solution. So when, as, the, as followers of God... The Bible says in any temptation, there's always a way out, right? God always provides a way out. But the way out, you got to choose the way out that God provides. You can't say, no, no, that's not the way out I want. I want to keep my sin and find another way out so I can carry this package with me. You know, there's something about Jesus saying, enter at the narrow gate. The gate's so narrow, you can't take packages, right? You can't take, you can't take the thing that you're wanting to take. You can't take your idol. It won't go through the gate with you. 
The idol has to go if you're going to fit. That gate is narrow. You can get through it, but not with anything, not with anything else. And so if you're trying to carry something else, you're going to have to like, well, I'll make it, I'll have a different solution. And that's what they're doing. And so God warns them. He tells them to write it down so that uh, this will be remembered, that they, they were re rebelling against God. The verse 10, they tell their prophets, don't speak to us. We only want to hear what we want to hear. Verse 11, they flat out say, get out of our way. We want to do this. And so God warns them, you're going to be broken completely, verses 12 through 14. In fact, so completely there won't be any fragments left that have any value. That's rare, okay? If you think of Israel's history, starting from the time they go into the land, from the time of Judges, how many times have they conquered? I never counted. It's too sad. I've never done that work. I've never gone through and counted. There, it's many, many times, right? We see the cycle repeated over and over. They, they sin against God. They get conquered. They cry out to God. He delivers them. Then they sin against God. Then they get conquered. Then they cry out to God and He delivers them. And it's over and over and over and over and over and over and over. It ends. There's an end. And God finally says, that's it. Enough. A lot of times people think that, well, there, that, that day never ever come. No, it comes. God decides when that happens. We don't decide, but God does decide. God does say enough is enough. And for them, this is the time. It's coming, and, uh, and they're going to get wiped out. But it comes with this promise. Uh, verse 15, one of the tremendous verses here. It, God tells them the way back. Thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel. And he uses four words. In returning, that's the first one, and rest, the second, you'll be saved. And in quietness, and in confidence will be your strength. The way back is not complicated. Return, rest, simmer down, <laughs> quiet, quietness, relax, stop sinning. Quietness and confidence, put your faith in me. It's not hard to come back, right? If you have a friend that's far away from the Lord and they feel like, oh, I don't know if I could ever, it's super easy to come back. The door's wide open. It's just return and in rest and quietness, put your trust in the Lord, you're back. It's not, a, it's not a hard journey back. Here's the problem, that last phrase in verse 15, and I wish it wasn't in there. It says, but you would not. You would not. God's not going to violate their free will, and so they say, we're going to flee on horses, and he said, well, you're going to flee, but you're going to get hammered, and he, and he announces their judgment in verse 17, and then another promise in verse 18, one of the great statements about waiting on the Lord. This is a verse you should memorize. It's true in it, this context, but it's also true, I think, in a larger context. This sort of interprets for us or helps us when we're waiting on the Lord. I think this is always true, verse 18. It says, therefore, the Lord will wait, and this phrase, that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you, for the Lord is a God of justice, and blessed are all those who wait for him. Many times we're in a situation where we're waiting on the Lord. Lord, why? What has happened? Why didn't you do something? Why? And we're waiting. This verse explains it for you. That waiting is because the Lord has a greater blessing. I'm looking at the situation. I perceived it in a certain way, and I need this to end so I can have the result that I think that I think needs to happen. And the Lord's saying, no, no. And he's, and he's not doing what I want him to do when I want him to do it. And so I'm waiting. I'm not going to, I mean, this is the proper, this would be the right way. Like, okay, Lord, well, I'm waiting, but why? Lord, why? It can be so frustrating or discouraging. But the Lord says he's, he's waiting that he might be gracious to you. My experience with waiting on the Lord is every time I've waited, his plan turned out to be way better than the plan that I had formulated. I've had wonderful plans for my life, by the way. I don't know if you knew that about me. I'm a tremendous planner. I got it crushed out of me, but... But I'm a tremendous planner who had wonderful plans for his life. God's plans, however, a billion times better than any plan I ever had. And it took him a little bit of time to sort of uh, help me learn the lesson that, listen, I don't need you to be in charge of your life. I don't need your help, and I've got a great idea, and your ideas are dumb. <laughs> You're, they're short-sighted. They're inferior. You don't see the big picture. You don't understand. You don't understand yourself. You don't know what's really going on. And so he's... He, Essentially, he makes us wait, but he makes you're only waiting. Every person in this room, every person listening, you're only waiting because God's doing something. And when God does it, and you'll look at it, you'll say, you know, I never want to go through that again. I wish I didn't go through it, but you know, the Lord was, the Lord was right. He knew what he was doing. 
He's, he's always, he's always, he always is gracious. And that, this verse is a tremendous verse. If you have friends that are waiting, this is a good one to have memorized that you can encourage someone with, like, hey, I'll pray this with you. Because I know you're waiting. I know you have something in your heart. And I know you're, you know, you're stirred. But you got to wait on the Lord. Blessed are those who wait for him. This is an advanced class, right? Waiting on the Lord's advanced. That's not, you're not, new believers don't have waiting on the Lord. They get immediate answered prayers because they got to learn that God answers their prayer. But then as you start to grow, the immediacy of things, it changes because God's trying to help you grow in other valuable things, which is learning how to wait. You got to learn how to wait on the Lord. So uh, remember when you're waiting, it's because he will be gracious to you. He, he always blesses those who wait for him. So it follows with this great uh, hope of uh, this grace being extended and, uh, and that God then will come to them. He's going to hear their prayers. Uh, they, they'll, they won't really uh, have their teachers anymore. They're, they're going to hear God speaking to them. Verse 21, this tremendous promise. Your ears will hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And you're going to toss away all your idols in verse 22. Uh, and then the Lord's going to bring healing to them in verse 26. It'll be like the light of the, the moon will be like the light of the sun. The light of the sun will be sevenfold. That God's going to heal the stroke of the wound. So this whole section, uh, following this blessing that comes for those who wait on the Lord, God said, listen, your future is so different than what I'm talking about right now. Yes, this is going to happen. Yes, the Assyrians are going to conquer everything except Jerusalem, but I'm going to deliver you. And then the Babylonians are going to come and wipe you out, but I'll bring you back. And yes, you're going to be a great diaspora. Yes, all, all this, but I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to deliver you. And so uh, judgment, the last half of the chapter is judgment on Assyria. Um, it's kind of an apocalyptic judgment where God says, uh, you know, my anger's overflowing. I'm coming to get you, and uh, I'm going to wipe you out. So... Uh, Assyria's judgment is promised. And then we go back to our initial subject in chapter 31, verse 1. Woe. So there's your connecting point. The word that holds these two chapters together is, oh, or you could just call it, uh-oh, or oh, no. I mean, whatever word you want to put in there that signifies, get ready. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. And notice, and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they're many and in horsemen because they're very strong, but don't look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. One of the challenges for human beings, this is something connected with waiting on the Lord, we have a natural tendency to rely upon what we see, what's tangible, what we can measure, and, uh, and not trust the Lord. There's a natural tendency even if God does a work beginning in the spirit, there's a natural tendency to try to make it perfect in, in the flesh. Paul tells the Galatians, have you begun in the spirit? Are you going to be made perfect in the flesh? I can hear my pastor's voice, Chuck Smith, for the last probably 15 years of his life. Every single pastor's conference, at some point when he was sharing, he would exhort the Calvary guys and just say, hey, we began in the spirit. Are you guys going to try to be made perfect in the flesh? When you hear your pastor say that every single pastor's conference for year after year after year, you start to get the idea of like, is he seeing something? Is he worried about something? Is he concerned about us? And what's the answer? Yes, absolutely. Now, is it something unique to us? No, we're just like everybody else. It's, it's human nature. God will start something and then we'll go, great, Lord, we'll take it from here. Great job. Rescue me out of this. Now we're all, the, now we got to figure it out. Now we'll do it in our own energy. Nope. No, we're going to wait on the Lord. We're going to keep trusting the Lord. We're not going to rely on any natural means. Does that mean we don't use natural means? Not at all. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about relying. What does rely mean? It means trust in. It means look to. It means seek first. It means depend upon. We're not depending upon any mechanism. And this is total foolishness, and we need to learn our lessons. Uh, sometimes these are hard lessons to learn, and they come painfully, but... Uh, here's a great verse. Woe to those who got into Egypt for help. You know, we're looking to the Lord instead. Uh, so uh, God himself will deliver them. He tells them he's going to fight for them. He's going to come down like a lion, he says in, in verse 4. Like a lion roars, he's going to come. The Lord is going to come down and foul, fight for Mount Zion. And uh, he tells them in verse 6, throw away your idols. You know, get rid of all these false gods. That's why the Assyrian invasion had happened because even though... The northern kingdom is falling because of their idolatry. The idolatry is in the southern kingdom, and they haven't repented. 
Hezekiah is a good king. He is repentant. The people, that, that repentance at the highest level hasn't permeated all the people's hearts, and they're worshiping idols. And he's, he's done away with it as much as possible for, on his side, but, but uh, they need to get rid of these idols. And then this promise in verse 8, the Assyrian will fall by a sword, not of man. We'll get to this before we finish tonight. We get the 6, 36, 37, 38, 39. We, we hear the story about how they come into the land and how God delivers them. But, but the prophecy is the Assyrians are going to be dealt with and it's not going to be a human means. And this is really important about means, the means to the end. God cares about the end, but God cares just as much about the means that he uses to reach the end as he does the result, the end. A lot of times people say, well, the result is good, the end is good, so the, the old saying, the ends justify the means. Well, it was a good end, so I went about it whatever way, even if it was an immoral way, that's fine, at least we got to the right end. God says no. God chooses means. His, the, the, the method that he uses or the means that he uses are just as important to him because in the process, God wants to magnify himself. He wants to show that he can do it. And so he's going to use means that that show everybody, God, God's doing this. It wasn't Egypt, it wasn't anybody else. It was the Lord. So he says, these Assyrians are going to be wiped out and not by the sword of man. Now, you know, the skeptical, what's going to happen? Was an angel that's going to go through and wipe everybody out in one night? Maybe. I mean, I've, I've had pastors, almost with that tone, say, to me, what, is God just going to blow, blah, blah, blah? Well, if he doesn't, it ain't going to happen. I don't know, like... Uh, Sad. We, we need to really learn to wait on the Lord. And so here's this picture. God's saying, listen, don't look to Egypt. Look to me. I'm going to do something supernatural. So that takes us to uh, chapter 32. And this is a total change of subject. Look at uh, the first word. We had woe. We had woe. And now what do we have? Behold. Beholds are almost always good in the Bible. Like It's like, hey, look. Or look at this. Look. Behold means look. So Behold, a king will reign in righteousness. So what we're going to be talking about here is this transformation. We're going to be talking primarily about this king who's going to reign. He's going to reign in righteousness. There will actually be a progression in the chapter. We'll go from a king, and then later we'll see the king, and then I think in the same verse it says our king. And I wonder if you're on that progression somewhere. Hopefully you're in the our king. Some people say, well, I recognize there's a king. Okay, good. Well, no, do you know he's the king? The? The only one? The one and only? And is he yours? A king, the king, our king in this chapter. A little bit of a progression. And so he's going to reign. He's going to be the king reigning, and there will be a transformation from the, of the degradation of man. Man is, uh, you know, who couldn't see or hear or understand. It's going to be set, you know, the men and all their foolishness is going to be set aside uh, verse 5 is really interesting. 5 and 6, it says, The foolish person will no longer be called generous, and the miser won't be called bountiful. And the foolish person will speak foolishness. His heart will work iniquity, practicing ungodliness and error against the Lord, and keep the hungry unsatisfied, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. The schemes of the schemer are evil. The wicked plans. He'll destroy the poor with his lying words and the needy. But a generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he will stand. So really interesting statement of judgment. It's that the wickedness that's in the land is being presented as though it, there's nothing wrong with it. People are being totally abused, and, then, and yet like, this person is the most, you know, has the most followers on Instagram. You know, kind of a, like this person's on television all the time, or this person's in a position of authority, and actually they're evil. They're, you know, they've got, like, they don't speak sense, they don't have any knowledge, and they're promoted, and th this judgment is going to uh, come upon them. And then, then the subject changes in verse 9 to women who are complacent. So we have kind of the, the picture of the fool and, and all of his foolishness. Now we have uh, the complacency of this other group. And uh, they're, they're, gonna, they're at ease at a time when they should be spiritually aware. And so uh, he tells them in verse 11, be troubled. You know, tremble, shake, you're at ease, be troubled, you're complacent. Strip yourselves and make yourselves bare and gird with, put sackcloth on your waist. Um, 
People are going to mourn upon their breasts in the pleasant fields and the, for the fruitful vine. So a, the, a judgment's going to be coming. And so they're, they're, they should start repenting right now and seeking the Lord. And seek the Lord until verse 15, the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. So uh, there's kind of a picture of the, the king is reigning, but what's in between is you've got foolishness, people getting ripped off, people saying lies and being promoted. You've got complacency, people very materialistic and, and totally careless about the circumstances when really you need to be desperately crying out for deliverance from this judgment that's coming upon the land. And, and the Spirit will be poured out, though. Justice, verse 16, will dwell, and righteousness will remain, and the work of righteousness will be peace. The people will dwell in peace, and, and uh, even if hail comes down in the forest, and even if the city is brought in humiliation, so uh, there's a hope for the future with the Spirit being poured out. Now look at chapter 33. What's the first word? Another woe. So we got a woe, a woe. Uh, look. The king is going to reign, but then still warning of judgment, but then hope for a deliverance, and then back to a woe. So you say, well, this isn't really a consistent message. Well, it is, actually. Judgment's coming, and God's going to deliver. But there's still a judgment coming. You need to get ready for it, but God's going to deliver, but there's a judgment coming. It's like, well, wait, which one is it? It is. Both. It's happening. It's going to happen in their lifetime. They're going to watch it unfold. And so here... Uh, this judgment now isn't necessarily on, on Israel, but uh, it moves out beyond, and it's upon those who've plundered. Uh, many people see this as being the, a judgment, uh, probably referring back to Assyria, that they plundered, but they weren't plundered. They were dealing treacherously, but no one dealt treacherously with them. So they're going to be dealt with. And so a prayer in verse 2 could be the people of chapter 32. It could be the Assyrians. You can decide, but someone's getting judged in verse 1. In verse 2, the prayer, O Lord, be gracious to us. We've waited for you. Now remember, when you read your Bible, you want to notice words that are the same and connected. So what was the great promise in chapter 30? When you wait on the Lord, right? Blessed are all those who wait on the Lord. And the, the, the Lord's waited that he might be gracious to you. And so now we are in chapter 33, and here's finally the audience or the people are responding. What's their prayer? Lord, be gracious to us. Because we've waited for you. And what was the promise in chapter 30? The Lord's waiting that he might be gracious to you. And so what's their prayer? Their prayer is directly related to what God said. That's a secret of prayer. If you can find it in the Bible as a promise or a statement or a reality, pray it. Say, Lord, you work for this person. You don't show partiality. Work for this person. I need it as much as they needed it. Or, Lord, your word says, so... Lord, do it in my life. And even if it's an act of obedience, even if it's you're getting convicted about something you're reading, say you're going through James and you're just talking about partiality and it comes into your heart. You're like, I'm partial. I've shown partiality to this person the other day. I've shown, like, oh. And then just pray, Lord, you said you don't like it. You said you don't want me to be like this. It's right here in your word. So, Lord, don't let me be like this. Change me. Change my heart. So good to go to the Bible, go to the word of God and find the, the direction for prayer. And so they do. Be gracious to us. We've waited for you. That's, that's exactly what we read in chapter 30. So they're praying. And then verse 3, at the noise of the tumult, the people will flee when you, so God's now answering, God's going to move. When you lift yourself up, the nations will be scattered and your plunder will be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar as the running to and fro of the locust. The Lord will run upon them. The Lord is exalted. He dwells on high. He's filled Zion with justice and righteousness and wisdom and knowledge uh, will be the stability of your times, the strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. So they cry out for prayer, and then they, God's rised up, and he's coming in judgment, and uh, he's going to fill Zion. He's going to be victorious for them. Uh, but mankind uh, languishes in verses 7 through 9. The earth is mourning. The highway is laid waste. And so God's coming, verse 10, I will arise, says the Lord, and I will be exalted, and I will lift myself up. And you will conceive chaff, you'll bring forth stubble, your breath as fire will devour you. And the people will be like the burnings of lime, like thorns cut up, they'll be burned in the fire. That's a pretty heavy image. What's being burned in the fire? People are going in the fire. And here, you who are far off, what I've done, and you who are near, Acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. 
And this question is asked among the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? God's coming, and the hypocrites in the congregation are afraid. And what are they afraid of? The fire is going to burn. And the question is, who can stand in the fire? Who can handle this everlasting burning? It's pretty heavy. You know, the New Testament talks about fire. John the Baptist, the last prophet of the Old Testament economy, when he was announcing the Messiah is at hand, what did he say? He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John the Baptist said, the Messiah, when he comes, you're not only going to be baptized in water, you're going to be immersed in fire. So we better be able to answer the question, who can, who can endure the fire? Because the, the ministry of the Messiah brings the fire. It brings this, well, Hebrews says our God is a consuming fire. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 9. He said, everyone will be seasoned with fire. Every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourself and have peace with one another. You might say, well, he's mixing his metaphors. He is. Starts with fire, he ends with salt. The sacrifices are salted with salt. All the sacrifices had to have salt. Jesus connects that image with the idea of fire. You have to have fire. There's going to be fire. Well, what kind of fire? Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. It's a fire of judgment in that sense. Has Jesus judged the sin in our lives? Yes, absolutely. He came to save his people from their sins. So our, our, our relationship with the Lord is not, is not a relationship of excuse making. It's a relationship of confession. We come boldly to the throne of grace. To, for what? To find help. Help for what? We're messed up. <laughs> it's a throne of grace. We approach it and we say, oh Lord, we come with confession. We come to our high priest who mediates between us and God, and he's provided the sacrifice for our sin. But we come in, in light of that sacrifice, and through that sacrifice, washed from our sins to find the help that we need in our time of need. It's not just help out of difficulty or help meet meet my financial need or help heal this disease, but Lord, change me. This is a really important passage of Scripture. Verse 14, the sinners are afraid, and fear has seized the hypocrites in Zion. And what are they saying? We can't dwell in this fire. Can you? You say, amen, please, Lord, burn. Let it burn, Lord, burn. (laughs) Burn away. We sing those songs, right? We sing songs about fire. We sing songs, holy fire, burn away. Do you mean those words? I do. Like, I love that song. Like, Lord, burn it up. Like, get it all, burn it all up, Lord. Let it all, everything's going to burn, burn it all up. I don't want any of it. The sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't want my flesh. I want to kill the thing. Crucify with Jesus. Get rid of it. I don't, you know, I want the stuff that doesn't burn. So it's interesting. When I'm gripped by my hypocrisy or and I'm gripped by my sin, I'm not that interested in the fire. I'm interested in the closet. Like, hey, that's a closet. Don't look in there. You know, what's over there, Rich? That's a closet. What's in there? Skeletons. Like, you know, like, no, that's where I, yeah, you know, I'm, what are you, why are you shoving scraps under the door? That's where I keep my flesh. You know, I'm feeding him, you know, he's, you can hear him behind you. Well, what, are you going to be in the flesh? Well, if I'm, when I'm pretending to be something I'm not. Such a heavy verse. So God's coming in judgment. He's coming in, in fire. And so, hey, uh, you know, repent really is the message. And then verse 17, the king coming. It says, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. What an awesome day. Can you imagine that? Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that's very far off. Your heart will meditate on terror. So where's the scribe? Paul quotes this in Corinthians. Where's the scribe? Where is he who counts? You know, where's the person who can calculate? You know, the king is coming. Look upon Zion, verse 20. Uh, Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet home. So he's going to restore Jerusalem. He's going to deliver the place. Uh, Verse 22, the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. Remember, a a king is going to reign. Then we got the king, and now we have, he's our king. And so this judgment coming, the Lord coming in glory. So chapter 34 begins, uh, the nations now. Come near you nations to listen 
and heed you people. Let the earth hear. So we were talking about Jerusalem. Now we're talking about the whole planet, right? So now the message goes out to the whole world. Hey, all you nations, listen up. God has something to say. This judgment is coming. The indignation, verse 2, of the Lord is against all the nations. His fury is against all their armies, and he'll utterly destroy them. He's given them over to the slaughter, and uh, he's going to wipe them out. They're going to be all stinky, says um, verse 5, my sword, God says, will be bathed in heaven and it will come down on Edom and on the people of my curse for judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. So we've got this apocalyptic picture of a judgment coming, beginning in the land of Edom. Verse 8 says it's the day of the Lord's vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. So Jerusalem will be protected. The nations will be judged. You could probably point to this, looking at the battle of Armageddon, the armies coming uh, up to Jerusalem to fight against the return of, of the Messiah, but the Lord's going to judge. Um, so uh, the judgment goes all the way to verse 15. And then the last part of the chapter, so it's really a bunch of a, kind of apocalyptic language about the finality of the judgment. Then verse 16 and 17 is the surety of it, the certainty of it. And so verse 16 says, Search from the book of the Lord and read. Not one of these will fail. Not one will lack her mate. For my mouth has commanded it, and his spirit has gathered them, and he's cast a lot for them. His hand has divided it with, among them with a measuring line that will possess it forever. From generation to generation, they'll dwell in it. So at the end of this announcement, uh, much like, you know, the book of Revelation ends with a curse. Like, if you take one word away from this, a curse be upon you. If you add one word to this, it's a curse. Like, this is, nothing's going to fall of this. This is the announcement of the judgment, an announcement of the deliverance by God. Don't mess with it. So this is kind of a similar, like in a smaller subsection, you know, of at the end of like, look, this is written down. The judgment's sure. And so that takes us to uh, chapter 35, a little short chapter of a glorious future. So the judgment in chapter 34, then the glorious future in, uh, of, the, of the reign of the Messiah in chapter 35, the wilderness, it says, and the wasteland will be glad for them. The desert will rejoice and blossom as the rose. So one, of the, one of the marks of, uh, of end times prophecy is agricultural rejuvenation of Israel, that the land will be filled with flowers, the land will produce fruit like crazy and fill the world with fruit. And it's something that we've seen happen in Israel uh, in the last you know, 50 years or so, um, really just become an agricultural powerhouse. The, so the desert is going to blossom. Land that just would look like it was a desert wasteland is going to be amazing farmland. And it certainly has happened. It will blossom abundantly, rejoice. There will be joy in singing. But this is looking at the future. The, it'll be even more glorious than Lebanon or Carmel. And they're going to see the glory of the Lord. So this is going to be the time Jesus reigning. Uh, but uh, we're seeing already the, the, the initial fulfillment of these things. So uh, there's hope. So verse 3, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees and say to those who are faint-hearted, or fearful-hearted, be strong, don't be afraid. Behold, your God will come with vengeance and with the recompense of God, he'll come and he'll save you. And the eyes of the blind will be open and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. And the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb will sing and the waters will burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground will become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals, where each one was lying, there will be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway will be there, and a road, and it will be called the highway of holiness. And the unclean will not pass over it, but it will be for others. Whoever walks that road, even if they're a fool, will not go astray. No lion will be there, nor will any ravenous beast go up on it. They will not be found there, but the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads, and they will obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing will flee away. So chapter 34 is judgment, apocalyptic language of judgment. And then now you've got a highway. We already saw this in this highway mentioned earlier, last week's section that connects Assyria to Egypt. And, it's, and remember Isaiah said that these three are going to be, Israel, Assyria, and Egypt are going to all be one, and there's going to be a highway connecting them, and you'll be able to go straight from Egypt into Israel and from Assyria down into Israel, and, and it's, it's a highway of holiness. So I hope it's got enough lanes. It's going to be traffic. I don't know. It looks like it's a safe place. You know, uh, 
Even if you're a dummy, verse 8, it says, even if you don't even know what you're doing, you're not, you can't get lost on that highway. If those of you guys who get lost all the time, you can't get lost on this road. It just takes you right to Jerusalem. And so all the people coming back to the Lord. So kind of a, a microcosm of the judgment and then the restoration, much like we see in the book of Revelation. Now that ends a section um, of kind of uh, prophetic words to the nations, to the nation of Israel. And now we get to a historical section. This turns into historical narrative, uh, our last verses for tonight. Uh, Chapter 36, it says, It came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came up against, and notice, all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Now, in the account, in the Assyrian uh, record of these events, Sennacherib claims that he conquered 46 cities of Judah. The Bible says whatever ones they had, he took them all. So I want you to think about this. The northern kingdom gets conquered by the Assyrians, and now the foray moves from the north. So the whole north is wiped out. Samaria, the great city of Samaria, their capital, destroyed, completely destroyed. All the Jewish people who live in the land, all murdered or taken away. Not into a captivity, but just taken away and put somewhere else by the Assyrians. And then, then they bring people from other countries and put them in the land. So that was their way of dealing with re- future rebellions. They take these people, put them in this land, take the people from that land, put them in this land, take the people from here and put them there, relocate everybody so you couldn't have that nationalism kind of rekindled. So uh, the northern kingdom's wiped out. Now in the south, you've got the land of Judah, and uh, they're, they're wall- walking with the Lord but remember, God said, we saw, throw, get rid of your idols, throw them away. So they're, they're falling into idolatry. They're being tempted to what? To look to Egypt and not look to the Lord. So they're not doing great. Hezekiah is a, it has a heart for God. He himself is seeking the Lord. The people aren't. And now God's allowing this judgment to come upon them. And what it says in verse 1 is, the Assyrians conquer everything except Jerusalem. they got one city left. It'd be like saying, well, the British came back and uh, took all the towns of the colonies. And the people that were left went to Washington, D.C., and they were hiding in the Washington Monument. I mean, you know, kind of like thing of like, well, they were up on Capitol Hill, and they got in the building, and they barricaded it. It's like, wait, that's not a good sign. Like, no, no, they took Philadelphia, New York, Atlanta. They took them all, and, and then they moved. And so it's like all that's left is the capital, the fortress, the city of David. They've gone in they've been behind the walls, and they're hiding. You know, what are we going to do? And... Uh, we're in trouble. So here comes the Assyrians, and they come with the Rabshaka. Now, Rabshaka is probably like a term like general, so it's not necessarily uh, his name, but uh, it's probably more of a title. He comes with the army. The king isn't actually coming, sort of coming as a representative. The king seems to have been down a lakeish where they, were, they took that city. And so he comes up, and he comes in verse 2 by the aqueduct. So they're, Israel, you got to remember the it's really, Jerusalem is, is really like on the ridge of a, it's like a, it's got a steep ravine on one side and a little va- valley here and then another valley that goes on this side and this main ravine goes up like this. So the Mount of Olives on that side, Mount Scopus over here, Mount Zion kind of over there, but, but there's valleys on all sides of this ridge that kind of comes up to a prominent, has different high points on it. And then, you know, there's a big valley down in the south part of it. So it's kind of surrounded by mountains. So it's defensible, right? You'd have to go down before you go up to get to them. So they're there. So this guy's on some kind of a point of prominence where it's kind of like, hey, Bill, yeah, you know, it's far enough where you can't throw a spear at him or get to the guy, but you're, he's up on top of this, act, like, he's like, hey, the army's in the valley all around Jerusalem, totally surrounded him. Anybody that's survived has survived by fleeing from the Assyrian army, and the city is now crammed with all these people who are hoping they're not going to get killed. This is the last outpost, really, unless they're out in the bush hiding. So now the guy's like, hey, we got a message. What's your message? Can you not speak Hebrew? You know, these people are going to get freaked out. I mean, right? Did you read the chapters? It's, it's very uh, blunt. Uh, the, the leaders come up to talk to this guy, and he begins to question their confidence. Verse 4. Hey, tell Hezekiah. You know, Hezekiah doesn't come out, but the guys go up. What are you, what are you trusting in? Verse 4. What's your evidence? You know, what are you, what's the basis of your uh, plan? In fact, he starts to mock, on, mock them and say, you're going to trust in Egypt. Egypt can't help you. 
What's the basis of your confidence? And then he says, verse 7, and this is really the turning point. Verse 7, he says, If you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God. Now you've got an unbeliever making commentary on these guys' relationship with the Lord, which is always, to me, this is tragic, but it's hilarious when unbelievers go, well, I don't know why they do that. The Bible says, like, oh, really? You know the Bible. Let's talk about other things the Bible says. TV commentator, man. You know, like, that's funny. When so you guys don't even know what the Bible says, you're going to quote the Bible like you're an expert. So look what he says, though. This is interesting. Verse 7, uh, you're saying you trust in the Lord. And then he says, isn't it he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you should worship before this altar? Because we were conquering all these cities. We found all these idols. And we, you know, he destroyed these idols. And like, isn't he destroying the idols of the Lord? Like, no, you dummy. Those were idols. <laughs> like, these people were in sin, and Hezekiah was instituting reforms and calling people back to the Lord. So the guy doesn't have any clue about spiritual things. That's why I'm not really ever interested uh, when the unbelievers want to, like, hey, we'll have your back. Let us, let us represent. Like, no, 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 don't represent us. Don't say anything about it. Don't even, you don't know what you're talking about. Here he's, he's mocking. He's going to mock the Lord. He said, uh, he's, first he mocks them. I'll give you horses, you know, if you can put people on them. Then he says, verse 10, look at this claim in verse 10. Have I now come up? Without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Really? So you're listening to the Lord. I didn't know that, Mr. Assyrian king man. <laughs> the Lord told you to destroy us because I'm pretty sure he didn't because the previous chapter said he's going to destroy you guys, actually. So they say, verse 11, I've always thought this was an interesting part of the story. They say, please speak to your servants in Aramaic. You know, they can holler back and forth. We understand Aramaic. Don't speak to in, in Hebrew. To the people who can hear and understand you. Then he says back, verse 12, Has my master sent me to your master and to, to you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste with you? He's calling it like, you guys are going to, we're going to lay siege to you guys. You're going to run out of food and you're going to drink your pee and you're going to eat your poo. You're going to run out of food. Sieges, there's, there's some detailed historical accounts of, the, of, of what went on in, during sieges, what people resorted to, is horrific. It's one of the worst things that could happen. It's one of the most horrible things that could happen is when the old, ancient, in ancient times when the enemy would lay siege and what ends up happening in the town is horrible. It's unthinkable. As people begin to starve to death, anything uh, you know, becomes fair game. It's very tragic. So he's sort of talking this trash to them and then he says, verse 14, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He won't be able to deliver you. And then verse 15, the very key verse, don't let Hezekiah make you trust the Lord, saying the Lord will deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Don't listen to Hezekiah. What, the Lord can't deliver? Um, Verse 18, beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of the Sepharvaim? Indeed, ha have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands has delivered their countries from my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? That's the, that's the winner right there, because who did he just pick a fight with? He's just like Goliath. Goliath's picking a fight with the Israeli army. Well, it's kind of like, well, you're probably, probably right about all this. But when he says, I defy the Lord, oh, bro, you just lost. <laughs> well, we could send out anybody now because you picked a fight with God. And so now they're saying, can the Lord do it? But they did, the people didn't answer. The government officials were quiet. They'd been given the word uh, to, to not speak. So Hezekiah tore his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord, chapter 37, verse 1. He went to... He went to pray. They resort to prayer and to seeking God. And they say, this is a day of, of evil. And, and so they went to Isaiah, verse 5. They, they sent their servant. He sent his servants to Isaiah. And Isaiah said, uh, I've heard, the Lord says, I've heard these words, verse 6. Don't be afraid of the words that you have heard from the, of the servants of the king of Assyria who blaspheme me. I will send a spirit upon him. Uh, he'll hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. And uh, so uh, that exactly happened. They hear, they depart, they go to Lachish, they hear about these Ethiopians coming. 
And so that kind of gives them a little bit of relief. So they send this uh, uh, Rabshakeh, they send a letter back, and, and he says, don't, you know, don't think that you're going to be delivered. No one can deliver me. And so um, in verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers. He read it. And then Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And then he prayed. This is one of the great pictures of how to deal with difficulty. He gets this letter, the same, same verbal threats that they had. Now he gets it in a letter form. He goes into, the, into this place where he seeks the Lord, the, as far as he can go into the temple, and he takes the letter and just spreads it out. Lord, here it is. Here's the matter. I'm laying it out before you. And then he prays. What a great picture. Anytime you get, quote, unquote, one of these letters, so to speak, just take the matter, go before the Lord, do, do the Hezekiah move, lay it out before the Lord. And what a wonderful prayer. Lord, you are the one who dwell between the cherubim. You are God. You alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. You made the heaven and the earth. So incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, which he sent to reproach the living God. And so, Lord, the Assyrians have laid waste to all the nations and their lands, and they've cast their gods into the fire because they weren't gods. But they were the work of men's hands, wood and stone, and therefore they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. Now, that is a prayer that can be answered, right? Here's my problem, Lord. I lay it out before you. And the main goal of the prayer is, Lord, be glorified. Lord, show the world who you are. Lord, this is what, this is what they say. This is what they're saying, Lord. But we know how this happened. These people in Samaria are worshiping. He even mentioned Samaria as worshiping these false gods. That's, those are Israelis in the north. They should be worshiping God. They're worshiping idols. That's why they fell. So we know what happened. So, Lord, we're aware. But, but Lord, you have to work. You're, you're alone or God. So please do it. So uh, Isaiah comes with a message. Uh, he says, because you've prayed this prayer, this is what the Lord has to say. So the rest of the of the chapter is the, the response of the Lord uh, up to verse 35. Uh, you know, God says, hey, I can do it. Um, I, I'm going to judge this guy, and uh, he's going to give him a sign. And, and the very end of it, verse 33, is the kind of the direct prophecy. He says, uh, he will not come into the city. He won't shoot an arrow there. He won't be come before it with a siege or build a siege mound against it. By the way he came, by the same he'll return. He won't come into the city, says the Lord. I will defend the city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. It's interesting that God specifies the reason why he's doing it. And this is something I think that's really important for us. You know, we, we're, we struggle a bit the way our culture's kind of warped our thinking. We're so, we have such a sense of entitlement. It affects all of us. We have, we have to go to the Lord on the right basis. God, the, what's the basis of this? It's not Hezekiah's prayer. It's just, I'm doing it for my own sake and for the sake of David. It's like, well, praise the Lord. It's good enough for me. I'll take that. Like, as long as you wipe the guy out, he's popping off about you, Lord. Deliver, deliver us, you know. For David's sake, Lord, the promises you made to our father. Praise the Lord, you know. For Abraham's sake, as long as I'm on the gravy train. and I'm gonna, It doesn't have to be for my sake because I'm like, you know, we... You know, there's a, we got to come to the Lord on the right basis, but there's God specifying it. So verse 36, this famous passage, the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. When the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses, they were all dead. Sennacherib departed, he went away, he returned, went to Nineveh, and it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his God, that his sons struck him down with the sword, and then they escaped, and then Esarhaddon reigned in his place. So this is actually also the same history that the Assyrians tell. They don't tell about their defeat. What's interesting is when he gives the listing of all the towns that he conquered in Judah, he doesn't mention Jerusalem. There's no mention of anything about Jerusalem. <laughs> so I think they was just like, well, that never happened. Let's just, 185,000 guys, we don't need to have that in our highlight. You know, so... Uh, he goes back home, and the, there is history also. He returns. He's, he's killed by his sons. Then this, uh, these last couple chapters of what happens at the end of Hezekiah's life, we have one last detail. 
It says, in those days Hezekiah became sick and was near death. And Isaiah came to him and said, thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Now, I don't suggest that you go to Isaiah for your bedside manner when you go to visit someone in the hospital. Uh, showing up, Hezekiah's sick, he wants you to come pray for him. You walk in, you're going to die, bro. You better get ready. But that's his very brief message. Get your house in order, you're going to die. So Hezekiah begins to pray. And he prays, Lord, uh, asking the Lord for some mercy. He wept. And so then the Lord spoke to Isaiah, go back and tell Hezekiah, I've heard your prayers. And I'm going to add, verse 5 says, to your days, 15 years. Now, I don't know that we can make too much of this. Uh, Pastor Chuck would always make this point, and I, I, it's one of those things, like I, there's not a commentary in the text that tells us, but that this story is included here as also in the Kings. It's interesting to me, the deliverance, but then also the desire to have the extra time, because in the end of his life, he has a son named Manasseh, and Manasseh is the worst king that they ever had. And so, Looking at it in the big picture, it like, might have been better to just set your house in order and die and let one of the other sons become the king because uh, him living 15 more years was not really better. So, you know, we don't, it's a narrative, so you can, you can decide for yourself what the application is because not, there's not really an application. But here's this, the story is included that he, he lives longer, but it's not like, well, Hezekiah comes, I mean, Manasseh is born during that time, and then this visit of these Babylonians. So it's kind of like he lived, but it's not like really a good couple chapters. It's kind of like not much good happened. So, you know, I don't know. You can make your own application. Uh, I think when the Lord's ready to take me home, I'm not going to be asking to live longer, just so you know. Like, you can pray whatever you want to pray if I start to die, but I'm ready. <laughs> I was really close to death once in Africa. I thought for sure I was going to die. And I, w I was like, Lord, I'm ready to go. Let's just get this over with. I want this sickness to end. Like, I'm, a, I'm miserable right now. I could just speed it up. Like, I'm ready. So I'm not going to be, like, asking to stay longer. Just, I'm not going to be mad at you if you pray that I'll live longer. My wife probably, I hope she, my wife will pray that I live longer if I go before her. Hopefully my kids or, I don't know, someone. I mean, you kind of hope maybe someone else will, but I'm not. I'm like, Let, let's get it. Let's go. I'm ready, Lord. I want to be with you. Uh, so I don't know. I just add that, that, you know, you could decide what you want to do with that. It's an interesting thing. So uh, he, uh, he had given, he's given this sign, verse 8, about, you know, the, and, and the sundial goes on the stairs, goes backwards. So it's an interesting miracle that God gives him. And, uh, and he writes a, a kind of a statement about, you know, how he had recovered from his sickness, his prayer, starting in verse 10. Um, you know, he's giving God, you know, you know, the glory and, and how God had delivered him. Uh, at the end of the chapter, verses 21, verse 21 says that, he, you know, there was some uh, applying of some uh, figs on, on, on this wound or this boil that he had and, and, he, and, he, and the, the record that he had asked for a sign. And then the last chapter we're covering tonight is just this uh, short little chapter uh, that's added uh, before we get into the, the real prophetic part of verse chapter 40 and on, uh, of a visit that comes. So at that time, uh, these guys come from Babylon. Now, remember, who's the reigning power? Right? It's the Assyrians. And the Babylonians are not a big deal. They haven't come to power. They're, they're not looking like they're a threat or they're a force, and, but they're, they're, they're leaders. It's a small little regional kingdom. And so they send a message because they heard he was sick. And so uh, that he had recovered. So he invites them. Uh, he invites them in. He shows them everything, verse 2. Shows them all of his treasures, all the silver, all the gold, everything, all of his spices and all the things that these accumulated. And verse 2 says there's nothing in his house or in all of his dominion that he didn't show them. There's a word for this, right? He showed off his stuff. Like so... Hey, here's where, here are this, and here's where we got this. And so he's just, you know, these guys are smaller guys. They've come to visit. Like, we heard you were better. Oh, yeah. Well, let me show you everything. Just like showing them how everything is. So then I, Isaiah comes to him and says, well, what did these guys say in verse 3? And where did they come from? He goes, oh, they came, they came from far away, from Babylon. Like, that's so far. 
And he says, well, what did they see? And he goes, well, I showed them everything. And then Isaiah said, Here's, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 6, behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house, what your fathers have accumulated until this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. They will take away some of your sons who will descend from you and whom you will beget, and they'll be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And then Hezekiah's response is, the word of the Lord which you've said is good. For he said, at least there will be peace and truth in my days. It doesn't really sound very sympathetic about the future. But each generation has to make its own decision, right? You, you're a grandparent. You want to see your grandkids on fire for the Lord. Well, how's that working? They got to make it. You can pray for them. You're praying like crazy, aren't you? You're, praying, you're maybe fasting and praying for them. You, every time you get time with them, you're like, let me did grandpa tell you about the Lord. Like grandma wants to, let me tell you the story about Jesus, right? You're, you do what you can, but your kids, you want your kids to be on fire for the Lord. How's that working out? You're like, well, three out of five or one out of two or all five, five for five or whatever it is. You want it, but every person has to make, so it's part of this. It might not be so harsh as it sounds in that, well, we're, you know, we're, hopefully my sons will follow the Lord. Hopefully it fall, comes later, but you look at this comment in light of the fact he wants 15 more years and the kid that's born in the 15 years is the worst king ever and saying something like this, well, maybe, I don't know. I, there's, there's, it's a historical narrative. There's no application made. You've got to look at it and read it and decide for yourself. But uh, considering that he gets, we have the, these like three chapters here at the very end are you know, describing the last things they want, that he wants to tell us about Hezekiah, it's not really that positive. So maybe... It would have been better to just go be with the Lord than stick around and say a bunch of dumb stuff and do some dumb things. So you can pray for me to live longer, but I'm, unbuck I'm unbuckling, man. I'm ready for the rapture to get me out of here. Lord, we want to say thank you for uh, how good you are. Thank you for even in the midst of all this judgment, we have some of the great statements of hope. Uh, here, Lord, and, and how to come back in returning and in rest and in quietness and in confidence. That if we would hear, we could return and we could rest in you, Lord. That what an invitation, what, what, what precious words. And Lord, when we meet those who are, who are heavy laden and so tired, may we remember your words, Lord, inviting those who are tired and heavy laden to come to you and find rest. And that they could take your yoke upon you and learn of you, get your gentle and humble in heart. It's a very, very same thing that what you're saying through Isaiah in returning and rest and, and in quietness and confidence, but they wouldn't. But Lord, some might. And so for those that do, Lord, help us to invite as many as we can to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Thank you for the, the promise of waiting, that as you wait, it's that you'd be gracious to us. I want to pray specifically, if there's anybody listening who's in a, in, a, in a great waiting period, a time of waiting where you've told them, look, just wait. And it's discouraging, and it's confusing, and it's hard, and they're hurting. I pray, Lord, that they would hear your still small voice, that they would take these words to heart, that they would grab that scripture, memorize it, meditate on it, pray it. But thank you, Lord, that it's true, that blessed are all those who wait for you. We always find that, Lord, your plan was better than ours. Your ways are higher. They're past our finding out. And as we wait upon you, we renew our strength. And we see you unfold things that we never would have dreamed possible. So, Lord, bless you. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you for your word. And thank you for the rescue from judgment. Thank you that we know the answer of the, of the, of the question that was asked by those hypocrites. Who can dwell in this fire? Thank you, Lord. Those washed by the blood of the Lamb have no fear of the fire of God. And that our faith can even be refined as if in the fire. Lord, burning away. Burn away all the dross, all the impurities, Lord. Thank you that, that in Jesus Christ, he's truly the fire of God. And that we're set free. Lord, we, we bless you and we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.